Hi, this is Maria Walsh and welcome to the Parachute Candidate podcast. My guest today is Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan. She joins us today to shed light on her lived experience of growing up in a house with parents who were dependent on drugs, becoming a mother at 15, grappling herself with addiction and homelessness, and her journey of trying to find her way through a dark place and break the system of discrimination. As an alumni of Trinity College, Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan is a psychologist who has been working as a senior lecturer in the Assisting Living and Learning Institute in the Department of Psychology at Maynooth University. She has published papers on equality, gender, education, inclusion, and STEM. She's the principal investigator on the STEM Passport for Inclusion Project and continues to do incredible work tackling digital inequality and equity in education. Most recently, Katrina published her memoir titled Poor in May of this year. Her book captures growing up as a middle child of five while living in extreme poverty and is an inspiring story that chronicles her life. She shares the importance of her relationships with incredible teachers who saw her potential and her spirit beyond her circumstance. Many of you will have heard Katrina's journey most recently on The Late Late Show, where she shared she woke up hungry, hungry for food, hungry for care, hungry to be noticed and afraid. Our conversation speaks openly on what access to education means to communities. She speaks on what privilege is and ultimately how it's crippling communities. We discuss power and empowering moments and being seen and heard by teachers, especially Miss Arkinson and Mr. Pickering. Here is our conversation. I always like to start at the end. So I am a professor in Maynooth University. Um, I'm really proud of that, actually. Um, I'm a doctor of psychology. And um, I'm the first in my family to um, probably finish formal education, definitely to get a university degree. Um, more than likely, I'm definitely one of the few who hasn't been to prison, which is, I suppose, an indicator of where my journey starts. So I'm here in Manus and I am lucky enough to run one of the largest programs in the country that aims to ensure that every young girl irrespective of class or condition, gets a STEM qualification before they leave school. And so that's my day-to-day job, trying to make sure that we're making the education system fair. And I do that in loads of ways, research, funding, industry partnerships. And I'm really successful at it, um, which is a great thing to be able to say because there was a time in my life where I really didn't even think I was intelligent. So the beginning of my story and the road here is it's long but I grew up in a family in extreme poverty you know there's layers in terms of poverty it's not all the same for everybody and I I I like to use the term rich poor and poor poor so rich poor are those people who are you know have jobs and not careers um they're you know maybe working living hand to mouth Um, struggling to pay their bills, we're getting by, credit union loans and all that kind of stuff. Whereas we were poor, poor, what that meant is we were on the social welfare. My parents were drug addicts, the two of them, which is quite rare. Usually it's one, but in my house it was two. So what that meant was uh, the neglect, you know. um, And I say that compassionately because addiction is a mental illness that affects us in the worst possible way. It makes us look like we're making bad choices and messing up our own lives and robs us of the capability to love our children and be the people that we were meant to be. And my parents, unfortunately, had that illness and it meant that I was um, hungry for food and stimulation from the very earliest memories of my life. And what happened to me as a child was when you go to school and you're hungry, it's very hard to concentrate. It's very hard to um, engage when you're just sitting there worried about what's going on at home. And the expectation in school is built on the assumption that everybody's the same and that we're all experiencing the same things. So while the teachers are trying to get me to learn maths and English and the words, I'm like, Wriggling in my seat, absolutely terrified that maybe my mom is dead or 
the police are there or something else. So like I was kind of the naughty kid in school, that girl that you really didn't want in your class. Can I uh, jump in there? Um, many in your family? Yeah, five um, kids. Uh, with, with the accent, the slight subtle hint, you were born in the United Kingdom. Two yes. Irish parents. My dad actually was in Goldenbridge. So my dad was adopted from Goldenbridge. A lot of the world will probably know that the, the Irish and the church um, has let people down significantly in Ireland. And um, one of the ways in which it let, let people down was the, um, in, is in children who were um, illegitimate, who were born out of a marriage. And my dad, there were certain, um, certain orphanages that were run by the church that have been, you know, it's been revealed that there was a lot of violence in them places, that children were mistreated. And my dad was actually in one of them uh, orphanages for the first five years of his life and adopted from there. So the assumption, even though he never, ever said what happened to him there, the assumption from our point of view and the life that he lived is that he suffered significant trauma when he was in that orphanage. So like one of the important points I make in my book is that, you know, uh, poverty and the things that predict poverty are intergenerational and so my my parents were were poor and traumatized and they gave birth to five poor and traumatized children and um unfortunately uh in my case like my destiny was pretty much set i think by their addiction and their poverty and so i grew up but also not just by my parents like the system in which I lived as well has a lot to answer for in terms of the outcomes because like in, in the UK and in Ireland, you know, back in the 60s and 50s and 60s, poor people were placed into communities together, housed together in council properties or social housing. And so what you had is high concentration of poverty in specific areas. And so what that means is as a poor kid growing up in a council or a social housing, you don't actually see anybody different to yourself. So even as a young girl, I never knew anybody who went to university. Actually, I did, but I didn't know that because my teachers obviously had been, but I didn't know. So I grew up in like an environment that everybody was poor and nobody really did anything other than what we were doing. So there was no way to aspire to anything other than possibly being a hairdresser as a young woman or a beautician or being in some kind of service position. And like the level of poverty that I was in, which was extreme, the teachers in my school didn't really see anything other than me than maybe finishing school. And unfortunately, I didn't finish school because my, your destiny is pretty much set for you by your, your socioeconomic status. And I got pregnant at 15 and left school with no qualifications and ended up homeless and so there was you know and and the thing that is important to me to talk about in my story is how you see yourself as a young person in that environment really restricts the things that you think you can be and how you see yourself is influenced by what your family is doing obviously and what they believe for you but also what everybody else believes for you so while my mum and dad were messed up, I also had a lack of belief in me from the systems and the structures around me. So the aspirations were just not there. And I had no concept that I was extremely intelligent or that I had all this potential. I just thought I was a failure. And when I left school, I genuinely thought I'm a failure and kind of lent into the life that my parents led, which was kind of drinking heavily, being on social welfare, trying to get social housing and living that way. You know, you mentioned there just the exception in hindsight is your teachers. And and I know you're, you you mentioned uh, Miss Arkinson and Mr. Pickering, if I'm pronouncing those correctly in particular. And yeah. um, they were exception versus rule. So I'm really so conscious of my language here because I want to make sure, and, and please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong or inappropriate and incorrect, you know, when you grow up in that in that environment, and right now in 2023 in Ireland, there are kids growing up in the exact same, and you are now the exception for them. For you, at what point did you say, right, this cannot be 
I am not a rule. I have to be the exception and break this for myself. Yes. I don't think I ever made that decision. I don't think anybody ever makes that one decision. So when you talked about my teachers, so like as a child in, in education, there was inconsistency uh, in terms of the care that I received in education. So, um, and, but there was a couple of people that actually fundamentally changed my life. Um, and they did that through caring um, and, and seeing me beyond just a requirement of the curriculum. So the Miss Arkinson, who you mentioned, that my first experience in school, I was really lucky. She's, she's from Ireland. She's from Tyrone. And when I arrived into the classroom, straight away, she was like, oh, my God, another Irish girl, because she could see from my name, which, which was lovely. Um, but she took, she took the time to reach me um, when others didn't. Um, so if you imagine I, I went to primary school, I used to wet the bed every night so um, because of fear. And so I'd roll out of bed and not wash and go to school and be smelly. And no one wants to play with the smelly kids. So I had all this trouble at home and then no one wants to play with me in school. And Miss Arkinson actually, um, she used to uh, give me a, a wash every day or she taught me how to wash myself and gave me fresh clothes. But in a way that was non-shaming and was really kind and she was like, you know, Katrina, we're just going to show you how to love yourself because we love you and we think you're an amazing girl, you know, really kind of met me at my level. And I knew she was good. And so it was easy, even though I was ashamed, I knew that she cared and that was fantastic. And she did other things that built me up. And sometimes in education, I think we forget the importance that teachers have on how children feel about themselves, not what they can do and be, but how they feel about themselves. And I like to use this in that, you know, analogy of like having lights placed inside of you that, you know, it was very dark in me as a child because of what was happening in my life. But these people, they placed little lights inside of me that actually shone when I really needed them. When I was alone and I was scared, I used to be like, oh, Miss Arkinson thinks I'm something. So I had that experience with her and she used to give me jobs. I kind of pick, you know, she used to pick me. Now maybe she picked everyone, but I felt like she picked me. And sometimes with a teacher, it's really important that they know that this is more like they're more than an educator in the sense of the words and the songs. They're actually the, the main person that a child sees. And then later on, fast forward into my teenage years, there was Mr. Pickering who in a different way, placed a light inside me. So this this teacher actually told me his own story, and he was a from a he was a mature student when he went to college, and he lit, worked in the mines. But this man kind of shared his his story with me, and I felt that was special. And he 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 saw my intelligence. And there's a story that I tell in my book where it's parent teacher meeting where you have your parents go in and your teachers tell you how bad or good you are and my parents never went. And this one particular evening, he there was a knock at my door after parent-teacher and um, I opened it and it was him. And I was terrified because I was always in trouble. So I assumed I was in trouble. And he was like, is your dad there? And I called my dad who was drinking um, in the living room and he came to the front door and I stood behind the door and I heard Mr. Pickering say, um, hello, Mr. O'Sullivan, I expected to see you tonight. And my dad kind of mumbled something and he said, um, I just wanted to tell you how amazing your daughter is, how how bright she is. But I also um, wanted to say how disappointed I am in you for not supporting her. You should be ashamed of yourself. And <laughs> behind the door, I think I must have grown two inches because this man who had no reason to come and challenge my father took the time out of his life and his busy day to just go that extra mile. Now, not all teachers can do that, but there is something to be said for seeing someone where they are and trying to reach them where they are. He gave me a love of uh, Shakespeare as well, which I was quite embarrassed about being a cool teenager. But the, the important thing to note about teachers is this. Sometimes a teacher won't know the impact they have. They'll never see it. So 
Mr. Pickering died. He he never saw. He saw me leave school at 15 and fail. Fail, as in, like, I didn't do what he hoped. But at 23, when the system rose up to meet me, I was able to draw on what he did for me and use that to succeed as an adult. And so teachers sometimes, I think, it's really important for them to know that they're impacting the kids, even if they can't see it. And it feels worth, worth like it's not worthwhile. It's so long-lasting, the impact that these people can have on kids, especially kids like me. I'm going to do a dog's dinner out of pronunciation here, but the unquantifiable uh, measure. Mm. And there's some teachers who are teachers, uh, and there's some teachers who it's a vocation. I believe all teachers should be, it should be a vocation for all teachers. That would be one thing that I would be really adamant about, that how we recruit teachers and who we recruit as our teachers needs to be really reviewed. It shouldn't be someone who has a degree in history and doesn't know what to do with that, who should be the people who empower our children. Because we all have a story of great teachers. And unfortunately, we all have a story of bad teachers as well. And But when you're poor, when you're rich and affluent, you can supplement. So many of us, many of many people I know are, who are better off, if they go to school, everybody knows who the bad teacher is and the parents will pay for extra study to supplement that loss. When you're poor, there's no supplementing. You're just left with a bad teacher who doesn't know their subject or know how to teach very well. And that's costly in a huge way. It's personally costly, but it's also costly for the education outcomes of kids like me. So I would definitely be an advocate that we need to re reconsider how we hire and who we hire as teachers. And taking that point there um, and hearing from you, and, and I would often say education is a powerful tool, absolutely uh, life-changing, but everyone doesn't get the same manual on how to use the tool. And, and that goes for anybody within the system, that goes for anybody stepping into it, stepping out of it. And, and, and I really believe in lifelong learning. I mean, at every point we learn, um, Hence the reason why this uh, this podcast is called Parachute Candidate. We all start to learn somewhere. We get we get dropped in sometimes by choice, sometimes by circumstance, and ultimately how we find find a way out of that is is a journey. But that journey is not the same for everybody because of that manual is not gifted to everybody when they're born. And 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 I really want to hear from you. You know, what did education mean to you at various points in your career? And your peers yeah. when you were growing up, particularly in the younger years. And I asked that question with a little bit of a caveat. Of a, there's this fantastic school in Mullingar. It's an Educate Together school, probably one of my favorite schools that I ever go to and have the privilege of going to as a member of the European Parliament. And the teachers there create an environment where, like as you were sharing, that specialness and that that space for a kid to be seen and felt seen and and felt heard. And uh, it's powerful, actually, every time I step into that school. Um, it's a gift to me, really. It's a recheck to say, bloody hell, Maria, you got to challenge your absolute BS view of the world when it comes to education because it's not the same for everybody and it needs to be in the sense of access to it. And, yeah. and that's where, sorry, I digress there, but I really wanted to give um, the context yeah. for today's world too because, you know, your your journey and story is is as I ca I can't stress enough. While it's your journey and experience, it's also happening in similar journeys and experiences today in Ireland, and 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 that leads on to another question about the education system now. But I really want to hear from you in terms of at various points, what did education mean to you? So, um, what's really interesting about what you said there is when when you said about the manual of how to use education as a as a person now who's educated. I, I see that those of the people who have the privilege of education don't have the manual and don't use the manual to use that education correctly rather than the other way around. So like from my, from, so what education gave me, it's very hard to explain it in words, but if you, if you imagine half of your, half of the room is darkened. So like I had a very basic way of of processing the world and the the very basic because i i believed what i was taught and what is taught by politicians in the world in the country um and in england and ireland and that that is that you 
you're responsible for your own life and you can be anything you want to be. All you have to do is work harder. And so and what work hard and you could be what you what you want to be is the the general message. So um and that's said quite clearly in leadership in our country and and I believe that. So like when I failed, which I did fail and everybody around me failed, I failed because I wasn't good enough rather than that this this the whole system in which I was living in had contributed to that failure in the form of like corralling people into it, poverty altogether, not investing in them, not providing them with the adequate resources to actually engage meaningfully with education, having inconsistencies in my teachers, having inconsistencies in the opportunities that our school offered, having inconsistencies in the subjects that were on offer and how they were taught. All these things I internalized as being just basic maths I'm failing, I must be stupid. And there was no actual um, ability, there was no criticality really in how I thought and saw the world. And that basic level of reasoning it was, was in most of my friends and family because none of us really engaged that highly in education. So the thought and the awareness of society and all the complexities and the beautiful elements of it were just not there. And when I went to Trinity... Uh, I, I read a lot. So like reading was obviously, I had words and I could read, but I didn't read like intellectually. I read for pleasure. What point did you step into Trinity and you became, you started that journey? So uh, what what happened to me was um, I was living in Summerhill in Dublin 1. I, I was I was actually, I'd have fulfilled my dream. Like basically my dream was to have uh, stable social welfare payments, to have socially supported housing this is this is security for someone like me so i was living in summer hill dublin one i had my social welfare payment i was getting my rental rent allowance and i had a little cash in hand job i was a cleaner in Connolly station and like that's what that was security that's literally the basis of security for someone like me but i had this sense constantly of is this it i i was cleaning the toilets in Connolly station the men's toilets one day and i was like this cannot be what I was made for, you know, like, um, and I was lucky because it was at the early 2000s in Ireland and we were in the Celtic Tiger and when there's, it, when there's money, there's investment in poverty and it trickles down and, you know, there's, there is good, there is good investments. And so at the time there was loads and loads of investment in community workers, in education programs. And so I found myself in Dublin one, there was a community worker who worked in that area and I just, called into him and I was like I really need help Joe I want to make a better life for myself and he the first thing he did was referred me to free counseling that was available in my community so that was the first step and that helped me kind of feel better about myself and then I did an adult ed program like a parenting program that worked around my child I was on my own with him and that was like a couple of hours a week and that's when I began to like wake up a bit I mean I was like oh I can finish something I could start something and finish something and I, I, I met a girl actually who I knew from town and she got into Trinity through the Trinity Access program. And she was boasting to me, I'm in Trinity studying law and I'm like, no way, they don't let us in there. Like, I didn't think you're allowed in. I honestly thought it was closed to, to people like us. I knew guys who went in to rob bike, bikes out of there, uh, but I really thought that you weren't allowed in. It's like I thought it was like government buildings. And um, she was, she was like, no, there's this thing and you get to keep your welfare and you get help with childcare. And so like, I think one thing that's under, under recognized is the value and the skill that exists in, in the poor community, the communities of who are living in socioeconomic disadvantage. Like I was well able to advocate for myself. I'd fight you for my, for my stuff. I'd, I was mouthy. I was well able in some ways I had skills, but they just weren't the skills that actually would get me into university. And I marched over to Trinity. I was literally like, if she did it, I could do it. And I marched over and I knocked on the door of this program. And it was I was really lucky then as well because ta the Trinity Access program had only started and they were just willing to take a chance on people. It's very hard to get in there now. But at that time, they were taking the chances on people like me who didn't really have a um, history, who hadn't done education much. So 
I kind of had this chat with this woman and I said, please just let me try for this. I want something different for my, my, my child. And she was just like, she just told me I was amazing. And I'd never had someone in that position say, you're amazing. She's just like, Irina Boydow was her name. She said, Jesus, aren't you amazing? Look what you've been through. You're amazing. And I, I found myself in an interview for the Trinity Access Program within a month of that day. And I got in. And when I started, that program is aimed at poor people. I had, I had funding for childcare. I had my lone parents benefit was kept. And I also, because that security is really important and it's not a negative thing. It's like, if you lose that, how are you going to survive? That's the way I li- thought. But the education piece was absolutely phenomenal. I don't think I've ever lost the, the desire to keep growing and thinking because I had been drained of that my whole life. And all of a sudden, I'm like reading Othello and seeing the themes and reading psychology. And I'm producing essays and they're telling me I'm good and I'm clever. And it's just unbelievably satisfying and and um esteem building to be told by a university like Trinity, not only are you good enough, but you're actually really intelligent, which I found that I was. I didn't know that. There's rocket fuel up here and it'd been sitting there dormant waiting to be fired. And so um but the feeling the thing of well, the hard thing about education is that um it it makes you aware. So like sometimes I miss ignorance. I miss just the basics because when I went to Trinity, I learned that I'm really intelligent, but I also learned that the system is rigged and that that university and the structures around it and the skills that feed into it are actually designed for people who have money, who are affluent. And the hardest lesson was that all the people know it and they decide not to do anything about it to make it fair out. And as a person who is who knows that I'm poor and I'm here and that she's my family and friends, they're also poor, but they could be here, but it's not there's no change in the system to they allow them. It was really saddening and upsetting and hurtful. Um and so yeah, educa- the education piece was inspiring, but also it made me really angry and it made me really feel like we need to do more to make the system fairer. For that then, to pick up on that and lead into it, the barriers then, you know, for you, is it, what is it? I, I don't want to put, put words yeah, out there so that in a few. The barriers were knowing someone who'd done it ahead of me um, and then the security of, of knowing that, like, I wasn't going to lose my, my rent, my supports, my supplements, all that stuff. That was really a barrier and then who's going to look after my child so like having uh child care or subsidized child care they were real barriers to participation and I was lucky because I got so much help with them things at that time the system was different and also then I had the Vincent de Paul the charity coming and, and giving me Christmas presents and helping me supporting me with laptops so there was loads and loads of um the, the barriers were de- were definitely system wide, like potential wise. Like I'm, we're we're all good enough. Like we just don't have opportunities that are the same across the board. So like potential. Actually, I I would go as far as to say that I probably have more skills than the average person that was in my class because I've actually I know how to survive and I've I've learned to advocate for myself and and manage money and manage time in different ways than some of the other students had. So. I kind of had a heads up on some of the things, but the barriers were definitely the financial, the making it clear, like this is, this is not going, you're not going to lose anything coming here. You're going to be safe. You're going to stay supported. And then also knowing someone ahead of me who'd gone was really important. It wasn't essential because you can meet people in the system who are good and you can relate to it. And then the other piece was, um, yeah, the childcare for 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 a mother. So for me, the motherhood piece was really challenging. And then for I know in your book and in and and I'm surrounded by your interviews right now around me. But uh, <laughs> previous ones, um, the inclusive learning environment piece. Uh-huh. Given your where you are now in terms of Maynooth University and and your continuous 
I mean, this is this is an education, so you're, you're continuous learning to when you were a student and even down to when you were a kid in Miss Arkinson's class. Like, how has that journey been? And ultimately for you, what is the best way for an inclusive learning environment? Oh, like my view is that education should be designed for people on the margins. So like my my view is that like when we design our, our classroom, we should we should be actually speaking to the people who are most unlikely to engage or mo- find it most difficult to engage, and that should be our target. As it currently is, we fo- we focus on the majority, so we design our stuff for the the middle learner, the person who is going to make it through probably anyway, and we accept in some ways that there's people that are always going to be on the periphery, but like if we flip that around and actually think about how do we what do we do to reach that person and ensure they're they're at the center of our curriculum and how we deliver the curriculum and how we structure the classroom then everybody else will be fine because they're going to get there anyway <laughs> the more affluent in our classroom or the more the people who have more generally going to get where they need to get anyway but it's it's really important and like Inclusive classroom, it's a, it's a hard term. Like, I do feel for teachers, particularly in the school environments. So, for example, like, some of the really important things that need to be done is, like, smaller class sizes are essential. Like, if you go anywhere in a disadvantaged community across Ireland, the class size just increases hugely because we're not investing enough in education in the areas that it needs to go into. So like inclusion needs smaller numbers, firstly, but it also needs then the creative thinking around what do we what do we deem to be success mm-hmm. in our in our in our system? So it is is success how many numbers you know, how many words you know, or is it is it is there a, some other way that we can assess that? Like I have loads of, of opinions and views on it. The hardest part for me in Trinity was realizing that I don't belong there. And having to go there every day and know that I am very different to your normal students, that was very different. That was very difficult. And there wasn't much celebration. There is celebration. So you might see TVs and articles and newspaper articles about the Trinity Access Program or inclusion. But in reality, what that looks like in the in your classroom, it do, you don't see it that much. And so the celebration of diversity is another thing that I think is more necessarily in a meaningful way. It's not charity to ensure that we allow everybody to participate in these elite structures. It, it needs to be, I suppose, seen as an, an empowerment. And we're ensuring that we're hearing all the voices and having all the skills rather than a charitable endeavor, which is sometimes that's what inclusion is. I don't know if I made sense to you there, Maria. No, and and, and I, then I, you know, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a product of privilege in the sense of my, my parents are like middle class. I never wanted anything. You know, I had born in the states but raised in in a rural community. You went to one school, both primary and secondary, because that's where every, you know, that's where you went. I never went to school hungry and I never came home from school panicked that there wouldn't be food on the table. And I'm really conscious of of my bias when it comes to education too, because often when I think of education, for me, the holistic student is often forgotten about. So I think of my, my own journey uh, and many of my classmates, you get honored by uh, regurgitating words on a page. Whereas you're not taking a student full on to say, right, why aren't we starting? Perhaps they want to start a trade younger. Um, so they're going like on like an intercert and they're starting their journey into the workforce earlier. They're getting access to hot meals in school now more and more. But, you know, the question I, I was like, isn't that great? But actually, why is that? That hot meals are so important to have. Uh, so because not all kids are getting hot meals at home or any meals at home. So. In my own journey in the last couple of years, particularly uh, with the political lens on, I'm like, wow, there is equity and it's very broken and there's equality and it's even further broken. But I often have to challenge myself around, to your point, what is success in our education? Yeah. Like, what is a successful education program? Um, and I, and I, I earlier mentioned, you know, educate togethers. I think they're phenomenal schools because it looks at the student and, and, and develops with the student versus, you know, at a student. 
But but what do you think when I say all of that? And please, absolutely challenge me, Katrina. Okay, so like when you when I got the email to be on your podcast, originally I was like, I'm not being a token poor person on the podcast. Okay, I'm going to be really honest because I was like, you know, my my view is this, right? I have privilege. I would have loved to grow up privileged. I would have loved to have two parents who were nurturing and had an education that was equal and all the opportunity was open to me. Like I did not begrudge anybody their privilege. What education taught me though was, especially the education I got, which was excellence from the best university in Ireland, was that when you're educated, you have the capacity to think critically about society. And that capacity allows you to see the inequity that exists in our system. And if you choose to do nothing about that, especially when you're in a position of power like yourself, Maria, or other people are in political in political roles, then you're you're complicit. So the child that struggles and is not getting fed is not getting it's not that they're not getting fed because their parents are no good, which is actually rhetoric yeah. that happens within the political system. They're not getting fed because their friends are bad. They're not getting fed because poverty reproduces itself. And we as a state, an educated state, who have enough money to solve this problem, have chose to ignore it and continue to um, keep our own privilege. And so, like, when you say, I, I would say back to you, you know, what are you, what are you, what are you doing with your privilege at the end of the day? So it's good. I'm delighted that you had that middle class life or a good life and that it was good for you. But it's like... What are you doing to, are you doing stuff to reproduce the inequality or are you actually doing the stuff that is required, which is the hard stuff to change the structures that are in place that keep this going? And from what I can see, so like preschool meals, like we're not going to solve poverty in one generation and its impact is not going to happen. But like providing every school, a desk school, every desk school with hot meals is a game changer. At least you're not hungry. That's, that gives people the opportunity to engage in education, which is a game changer for children. So like that's a, that's a really essential piece of this. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to sound controversial to not you. No, not at all. In success because. terms, for me, what, what success is in education is ensuring every child sees every opportunity and then makes a decision based on that, based on having the opportunity to be and do everything that that is out there and as it stands currently that's just not we're nowhere near that like even in the educate when we we talk about leaving cert and when the results come out and loads of kids in deaf skills don't get the points and loads of kids in private skills do what will happen is we'll have conversations about all the wonderful apprenticeships that are available for the kids in the deaf skills and the reality is that just keeps reproducing those who are in the service profession, prof professions and those who are not. It never, you never see, hardly ever see a kid who, got, who went to a grind school becoming a plumber. It doesn't happen very often because that is a low status job and will not give you the affluence you need to participate meaningfully in the good life. So yeah. <laughs> the and, education, and I, I think. Point, but I mean, I have a group of, of mates who would have had, a, had access to grinds uh and 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 yeah. chose for themselves an avenue to apprenticeships because that's what they really wanted to do so i do hear your point i just want to make sure you know oh yeah but they had the opportunities so like they had they chose that which i think is wonderful like don't get me wrong my husband's a carpenter like that like we need i've no issue with people doing grinds but the people in the desk schools who don't get the points we don't know that they can be all the other things they don't choose they don't choose that. They're not. They're not disregarding going to Trinity and becoming plumbers. They're going. Oh, this is all I can be at the end I of the day. Really so, know. like your friends who choose to become, which is one. Like we need more of that. We actually need more people from all works of life to take apprenticeships, and all people from all works of life to go to Trinity. Yeah. But the reality is, as it stands, we don't have that. And it's like, how do we? How do we meaningfully change these norms? And like, we can't do it. Like, no, I can now in my position because I have some privilege, but like poor people 
can't actually change their own lives. Like it's too hard. They don't even know the options. It's really our job as those who are educated and privileged in society to try to ensure that everybody has equal choice and opportunity. I hear your point. Sorry, I was on, I heard something else and that was my own BS that was hearing it. So thanks for, thank you no, no, for fine. joining me through on that one. Access to opportunity and choice is yeah. is is often what's not on the, the same page uh, for everybody else. I, and I heard you on that. Picking up from what you just shared there, do you think education in Ireland is changing? Um, I think, wow, I, it's definitely changed. So like even the completion rates, um, Obviously, like in the last 30 years, we were at 98 or 96% of kids are completing. I definitely think it's changing. I don't think it's changing fast enough. Like um, access, access. there's great programs that run separate from the core of our education system. So like there's great programs like the Trinity Access Program, Maynooth Access Program, there's there's loads of wonderful things that run on the periphery to try to adjust the completion rates, but who gets access to them? It's not always easy to get access and information. Like we do have great things like the here scheme, the dare scheme. So like, it, yeah, it's cha- it is changing. I just don't think it's necessarily changing fast enough. And I think that's a lot more that can be done. Obviously there's always a lot more that can be done, but it's definitely changing. And it's heartening to see the change. It's heartening to witness kid, more kids like me come into university and, you know, avail of jobs that they'd never think of. So yeah, it's changing. It's just not changing fast enough. And I'm worried that we're going backwards. Like again, we're in, we're in a, we're in a, a, a moment of money in Ireland. Again, we're, we've got all this tax coming in. We're doing really well financially as a country, but we haven't reinvested the way we did in the early 2000s in education and community and creches in poverty in the same way. And that worries me that the value isn't there and that we don't continue to do the great work that we've done. Like I said, if I was poor today, if it was today, I wouldn't be able to be, I wouldn't be here because the system has changed so much that I wouldn't be able to avail of the same supports that I did back in the early 2000s. And that worries me a lot. Those supports that you mentioned, though, is like access to childcare, access to support so that you can continue learning and not worrying about yeah. the, the supports in place for, you know, in terms of social housing, medical support, et cetera. Is yeah. that what you mean by that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like you now you lose one, you gain one and you lose one. And like I, I'm really cognizant of saying these words publicly because there is a, a general idea of people who co- who live in poverty that we're 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 bludgeons. We we want to live off the state and all that stuff. Like so, it's, I'm always worried about speaking about it. But like it is it is a mindset that you inherit and you you're taught from a very young age to have this dependency because otherwise, what else do you have? So it's it's survival. And when people are trying to survive, they really can't plan for their future and think about activation programs and all the great things that are out there in the system. And so it's not, I want to really stress that like by empowering me as one woman, like the future of my whole family has changed. So like investment now actually saves so much down the line. So like I'm paying loads in tax. I am I have two, three kids and they're going to university. They're not going to be on social welfare. They're not going to have the medical issues that go along with poverty. All of these other costs are reduced by actually investing meaningfully in people. So I want to be, con- I'm conscious of saying things that, you know, reinforce negative stereotypes about people in poverty. Because I, like I said, remember, I didn't have a ch- I didn't have a choice. There wasn't like some, I wasn't like optionally going, well, I'm not going to do that in favor of this. This is all I knew. And that when that's all you know, like what else are you supposed to do? It's only through the activation programs and the supports that brought me to a point where I'm actually able to see the world in a different way. In terms of keeping in line with the education where we where we are, even to your point on, and there is money, there's money in the country and how we spend it is incredibly important. Can I touch a little bit about COVID-19 and the impact it had on students? Yeah. 
do you or have you seen or are you expecting to see the impact of that in a negative way or is the fact that you know people were able to study and, and learn within their own homes easier or more difficult because i think there there's misconceptions about it being great i can work from home i can study from home but everybody's home life is very very different so yeah in i had personal experience of this actually being a mother and having children at home having to study from home and the consequences of that um, were bad and good. So from a personal point of view, I, like I I think like my son did his leaving cert this year, we're still feeling the effects. He was still feeling the effects of COVID. One of the things that I think COVID really highlighted for education is the digital divide and the the the, the and up, but not just in in students, but also in schools and schools' capacity to actually deliver education in a different way than what we've always delivered it using technology. So we we could see we from my research and my work in edu- this is where I'm, I'm I specialize is that you know we saw this big gap between who could stay on who could be online and who couldn't. And that related to poverty, but also related to if you're in the arse end of Athlone <laughs> and you don't have uh, <laughs> You don't have access to Wi-Fi and all that good stuff. So I think it definitely brought to light the skills that are lacking within our system and the infrastructural problems that happen. Um, it also, I think it added pressure to women particularly and pushed women back a lot. And I'm concerned about the drive to what, you know, the move towards work from home. Like the majority of people who are working from home are actually women who who want to keep it as that because there is the fourth, the, the second shift. I call it the fourth shift because we're doing loads of extra jobs as well as our own jobs. But like the drive towards being able to drop the kids to school and clean the house and do the washing up at the same time as doing our job is kind of, I think, keeping women out of the office. And that worries me in terms of like how we're going to ensure that women stay engaged in the workplace and and and, and get promoted basically and stay but like in terms of kids, I think there was two sides. I know in my own home, like we had the harsh elements of like junior sir and not, no, not, he didn't have his junior sir. It was a mess. The teachers didn't even know what to do. They didn't even know how to deliver online. It was a mess. But we also had this kind of relaxing, relaxing time together as a family that sometimes missing when you have to get up at nine and drop them to school and bring them home a tree. So there was learning that went on and connections that happened that was lovely. And it's, I think it's, it's sad that we haven't really kind of, we've jumped straight back into get the leave insert normal, get the points, get the thing. We haven't been able to kind of grasp the moment and say, let's change the leave insert. Let's do the, let the teachers do some of the assessments. So it's a bit of a mishmash. I don't know if I answered your no, question, I but I am cognizant no, of the no, impact. No, I did because you're right. You know, it's, we're, we're, we're at the crossroads or at least. I don't know, sometimes is the crossroads a little bit behind us and we've missed the beat uh, and that moment of, of bravery yeah. to to actually change things for the better. And we know society moves a hell of a lot faster than and, than our political landscape. And, and that I thought we might have a moment and fingers crossed we might, but that might be me being more optimistic than realist, uh, uh, which my team often tell me about yeah. two, four years young in politics. Yeah, well, it's good to be optimistic. Like even, even though I'm, I'm drawing attention to some of the the negative parts or the negative the, the the darker sides of things. Like I'm always hopeful that we can do better and we can and my experience is that we we can do better and we do do better if we if we have a vision um and we will you know a specific vision and we allocate expertise to that particular vision, we can we can move mountains like we're Irish at the end of the day. We've survived so much and we're strong. As a as a country, but as 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 individuals as well. So like, while there's so, so much not right, there's also a very strong, resilient, educated group of people in our in our in our country that can actually make these changes. So I'm always hopeful. I, I want to pick up before w- before we wrap, but I'm I'm conscious of of your time. Um, can you yeah. share your work with the STEM Passport for Inclusion because? I noticed, and and I know, uh, given your role with Manuth and 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 your real hyper focus on on digital and the digital divide and and the work we can do, I really wanted to pick up on this yeah. question. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that emerged from our work during COVID 
was obviously the digital divide, but like the, there is definite, there's a STEM, we're in a STEM revolution at the end of the day, all of the jobs, we just need to understand technology to be able to engage in life and science. And one of the observations from research is that there's a certain group, groups that actually are least likely to qualify, achieve a STEM qualification and are least likely to work in STEM jobs. And that's not just girls because girls are underserved, but not all girls are the same. And girls who are in working class communities, girls who grew up in poverty like me are the least likely at the moment to engage in STEM qualifications and skills, STEM subjects because they're not on offer or because they're socialized out of them. And it's put it, they're really at risk and not just of obviously not developing the mindset that can think critically about science and developments, but in terms of the economy of not being employable. And if you, if you leave women, working class women undereducated, what will happen is it will re reproduce itself. So we actually develop, like, there's no issue with these women. There's these girls, they have, there's so much potential. It's just the system doesn't actually suit them. So we developed a systems approach to ensure that every girl, our goal is to ensure every girl, irrespective of class or condition, graduates from school with a qualification in STEM. And we, we partnered with Microsoft, SFI, and the Department of Education. They funded us. And basically, what we've done is developed a kind of a two-pronged approach to this problem. The first one is we've developed a STEM qualification that the girl, that 5,000 girls in Desh skills across Ireland will achieve in the next two years. And they will graduate from a university in their community with a STEM qualification. And they'll be able to use that qualification for 50 leave insert points towards STEM courses within that institution. So, for example, we link with girls in Inchicore, girls in Tala. We have now a program that we run in their schools. They get a qualification. They're a university students and they get 50 leave insert points. They can come and study engineering here in Maynooth or they can do computer science here in Maynooth with that. That's the first thing. Pathways, qualifications, turning them on to STEM. But in the program itself, it, what they do is they do loads of stuff on the sustainable development goals. They learn how to design products, present, send emails, think critically. So it's like skills for everyday living and all jobs as well. Then the other piece is mentoring. Girls in working class communities have loads of role models. I, had, I saw some amazing women when I was a kid who got up early, worked hard, fed their families, but they just don't know people in high status professions. And the people in them professions don't understand inequality as well. So we have this mentoring for equality program where every girl gets to meet a woman or a man now who actually works in a high status profession. And we developed a micro credential that actually teaches industry about inequality. So we're trying to educate industry so that they can create pathways for the girls as well as allow them to form a relationship. And we've been really successful with it. It's 1.2 million in funding. Five thousand. We've got three thousand five thousand three thousand girls registered for this September, and we're partnering with Munster Technological University, ATU, all the universities we want on board for this. Powerful. It's brilliant. And uh, you know what, though, I it, it it never what what my favorite part of the program. Obviously, the girls always excite me and empower. Like, but I know their skills. I, I worked with girls like that for years. I am one of them girls. What's really exciting is actually to see the impact on the micro-credential on the women and the men in industry. So actually teaching people in elite positions about inequality is game-changing as well because they don't really know what they can do and how they can help, and we give them that information. So we've, we're creating this army of people who just want to do more and make things a little bit fairer, which is, is great. And it's great to be leading that and just feeling like I'm taking my own privilege, which is my education and my poverty, and using it to try to make things a little bit fairer, which I'd call on everybody to do. As we heard from Dr. Katrina O'Sullivan today, education is powerful. However, barriers to education and inclusion still remain. As a policymaker, this conversation really hit on the impact many face when it comes to assessing education and feeling seen. In 2021, the European Commission reported 25% of children in the European Union were at risk of poverty. While Katrina and I discussed poverty and the positive impact education has on people and communities from an Irish and UK perspective, I fundamentally see the value the EU can be and needs to be here. 
On Katrina's website, she shares, We love a rags to riches story, and we love to see someone triumph through sheer determination. But the story is rarely that simple, and my story isn't anyway. It's extraordinary to think how lucky I have been. After reading and hearing Dr. Katrina Sullivan's story, I, I hope this leaves you as it has with me the understanding and drive to be a powerful teacher, a more understanding community leader, and promoter of education to all, not just some. I encourage you all to read Katrina's book, Poor, and as Brendan O'Connor rightly shared, it should be on every leaving certificate reading list. <laughs>